Here's a look at the amphibians of northern Wisconsin. We're going to have a little identification session here. We'll have uh, images of them and sound samples of their calls and also talk a little bit about their ecology here in the Northwoods. So what exactly are amphibians and why are they important? Frogs, toads, and salamanders are the most common forms that we see in North America and uh, typically they all undergo what is known as metamorphosis where they start out as an egg and hatch out into a larval form and then change into an adult form. They're also all highly dependent on clean water especially in their early life stages. Uh, amphibians have very permeable skins and as a result of that any environmental pollutants can easily get into their systems. There are approximately 7,000 species worldwide and 34 percent of those species are in danger of extinction right now due primarily to water pollution, climate change, uh, diseases, and overexploitation by humans. They are as a group important indicators of ecological health due to their dependence on clean water. Uh, they play a very major role in a lot of ecosystems. A good example of this is in the Pacific Northwest Salamanders are the highest uh, vertebrate biomass present in that system. That's a kind of an amazing fact because if you, if you were to remove them from that system for some reason, you could have an almost a complete ecological collapse. So even though they're not always visible, they're playing a very important role in our world. So what exactly is metamorphosis? We see in that uh, back image there a, a mass of eggs that's been laid on some underwater vegetation by a frog. So they start out as eggs, uh, much the same way fish do, and then emerge as a tadpoles or aquatic stages that we see there on the left slide. Um, after a few weeks they start developing into sort of intermediate forms. You see in the middle picture there we have a, a familiar looking frog but it still has a tail. Eventually that tail is fully absorbed back into the body and then we end up with the, the familiar adult form that we see there on the right. They can be found in a number of different habitats across the world. Uh, all of course are wet habitats as I mentioned before. Marsh, and lake and bog complexes are home to uh, frogs and um, mostly frogs, sometimes uh, salamanders. Ephemeral ponds, which are uh, ponds that only exist in the spring and dry up after a certain period of time, are usually uh, inhabited by salamanders and some species of frogs uh, just briefly to uh, undergo mating and egg laying uh, the, in a race to actually reproduce before those ponds dry up. Streams are also important to some species uh, and uh, in later on with adult forms uh, woodlands because a lot of these animals will leave the ponds and move up into moist wooded environments for uh, the remainder of the summer season. A number of factors make life challenging for amphibians. Probably at the top of that list is habitat conversion by humans. Whether it's for agriculture, urbanization, creation of roads, subdivisions, um, drainage of wetlands for various reasons. All of these types of activities can uh, completely eliminate local populations of amphibians from the landscape. They are also prey to a number of uh, predatory species from large aquatic uh, insects as we see in this lower left image to uh, all kinds of terrestrial animals from uh, snakes to foxes, coyotes, bears, and humans. Also, disease and invasive species are becoming more of a problem for amphibians. In recent decades, we've seen uh, disease in particular of, of fungal nature uh, becoming more and more prevalent, especially in tropical amphibian species. And this may be linked to climate change, where changes in humidity and temperature are causing shifts in the types of microorganisms that live in these environments. And the amphibians that are there may not have the biological defenses to, uh, to allow them to be saved from uh, infection. Also invasive species where predatory animals are introduced by humans that will prey on amphibian either as uh, either amphibian larvae, eggs, or as adults and they may just voraciously consume and uh, 
completely eliminate the amphibians from the landscape in that way. And also climate change, which is uh, an ongoing emerging issue and as the effects of climate change uh, dictate the moisture in a given environment, whether it dries it out or makes it more moist, can change what amphibians have evolved in and become accustomed to and they may not have the ability to adjust to rapid change and if they are unable to leave and move into a different environment then they're pretty much doomed to extinction. Probably the most long-term effect humans have had on amphibians has been through pollution of the water and this has been going on since before the industrial age but obviously it's gotten worse in, in recent times and uh, because of their life stages and their permeable skins that we talked about earlier uh, they are quite vulnerable to water pollution. The first amphibians to emerge from hibernation in the spring are the salamanders. Quite often they can be found as early as mid to late March actually crawling over snow in some cases to migrate to their uh, breeding areas which are ephemeral ponds uh, almost exclusively. This can be problematic for them if they have to cross roads and quite often uh, a number of them are, are killed by cars in the process. Um, they're all very similar in their lifestyles. Uh, here we have the uh, blue spot salamander on the left, the uh, tiger salamander on the right upper and the uh, yellow spotted salamander below that. Uh, they all after breeding move into moist woodland areas where they live under uh, leaf litter and uh, sometimes in the soil to uh, forage for earthworms and other invertebrates that they feed on through the through the summer months. Of course there are always exceptions and there are certainly exceptional salamanders. We have three species in Wisconsin that have life stages that are sort of atypical for what we normally associate with amphibians. The central newt in the upper right there um, ends up as an adult in a living an aquatic lifestyle. They start out as an egg and go through larval stage and then come into what's known as an EFT, EFT life stage where they live a terrestrial existence like most salamanders do and then they go back to the water and spend their adult lives as aquatic salamanders. The redback salamander on the left there um, is unique for a couple of reasons. One, it hatches out as a tiny adult stage. It doesn't go through a, a larval stage that we're familiar with most amphibians. Uh, the other factor is unique about them is they are in a group known as lungless salamanders. They don't have functioning lungs at all but simply absorb oxygen through their skins. The mud puppy on the right there is the largest salamander in Wisconsin and it is what's known as a neotenic salamander that is its adult stage is the same as a larval stage so in this case they stay aquatic their entire lives as adults and in fact have gills which um, as, the, you know, as the larvae have so they're, this group is, uh, again, the exception to the rule. Frogs call in the spring to attract mates to ponds and wetlands for breeding. Usually the first frogs we hear calling in April are the spring peepers. Closely following them are the chorus frogs and wood frogs. A little bit later on, the second phase takes place where water temperatures increase a little bit more and American toads and gray tree frogs begin calling. Then there's a distinct third phase which goes into the summer months when bullfrogs and green frogs are the predominant amphibians that we hear calling. So here's the spring peeper, the first frog to emerge from hibernation in the spring. They are relatively small, just a little over an inch long, but they're easily identified by the sort of X mark that you see on their back there. That's uh, Their name, uh, Crucifer, comes from the fact that there's this distinct uh, X mark. The 
another one of the early emerging frogs. This is the wood frog. And uh, these are restricted to ephemeral ponds for breeding. So they have to emerge quickly from hibernation and be, take care of all of the reproductive activities before those ponds dry up. So they usually only have a, a few weeks at most to accomplish that. This is the northern chorus frog. This is another early emerging frog in April. And uh, they're easily distinguished from the spring peeper because they have this large, blotchy, sort of barred uh, set of markings on their back. Quite often they can be found calling right next to spring peepers. This is the northern leopard frog, uh, the last of the early emerging frogs. They are found uh, only in lakes and large open water ponds. They uh, wind up their calling activity very early in the spring and are usually done uh, usually by about the middle of, of uh, May in this uh, part of the state. This is our second phase of calling now, which is a little bit later in the spring into May. Uh, the American toads are very abundant and uh, usually can be heard in very, very large groups calling and almost a, a most deafening sound. On the right hand side there we see them uh, in the act of uh, reproduction. This is known as amplexus. Uh, the female is on the bottom and uh, she's laying eggs and the male is externally fertilizing them just uh, the same way fish do. This is our other middle phase calling frog, the eastern gray tree frog. The name is something of a misnomer because as you can see uh, they can also be green, a, a number of shades of gray or green. These animals will call uh, into, actually into June, um, and overlap somewhat with the later calling amphibians. They have one of the longest calling phases of the, all the amphibians we have here in Wisconsin. Now we start our third phase of calling, which runs from uh, late May uh, into probably early July. This is the pickerel frog. This frog is found only in uh, lakes primarily. And the largest frog we have in the state, the bullfrog. Again, this is a lake dwelling frog for the most part, although they can also be found on the margins of wetlands as well. And the green frog. This is uh, another frog that has a very long calling period. Uh, it can start in late uh, May and run actually into August or later. In this uh, the call sample we hear here, it's uh, you can hear it's mixed with gray tree frogs. The the uh, twanging sound it sounds like a loose banjo string. That's the actual green frog call here. And finally we have the mink frog. This is a open water dwelling frog that we can be found in um, lakes and large ponds. This one's a little special because it's at the extreme southern edge of its range. Um, this is what's known as a boreal species or northern species and is much more abundant in uh, northern Minnesota and up into Canada. Well that's it for our amphibians. I hope these, uh, these pictures and sounds have helped you um, sort out identifying them a little bit and if you have further questions please contact us at the Superior Rivers Watershed Association and uh, we can answer more questions about amphibians or any other questions you may have about our wildlife here in the north. Thanks a lot for listening.